the name of Jesus, and you would give me just the words to say. Father, but also I pray that you would allow these words to touch the hearts of people. Father, we know that the devil fights each day. And Father, we are on a path towards heaven. We are on a path to be with you throughout eternity. But Father, I know that everything that we do in this life determines our end. So Father, I ask in the name of your precious Son that you would give us this wisdom in this, that we would seek your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us along this path. Father, we know that there's many stumbling blocks and there's many detours that try to, to trip us up. But Father, I know that as long as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, that we will walk this path and we will have the victory. And Father, that's what we seek. So I pray your Holy Spirit would touch this message. Father, touch each heart and life that hears it. And Father, may it draw us nearer to you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. For years, Laddie Marshak had a running correspondence with the gas company. Every month, she either overpaid her bill, underpaid her bill, and this went on for a long, long time. But one day, the gas company sent her a postcard with all these different reasons why her gas bill would be different every month. Whether she underpaid it or overpaid it was determined by whether she signed the check, whether she wrote the right name on the check, all of these things. Well, well poor old Addie, she looked at all these things, and none of them had anything to do with her. They was all just uh, generic kind of answers. But she turned the card over, and on the back of the card, it said this, please pay the amount listed. You continually pay the date. <laughs> and I thought, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. But you know, that's confusion. And that poor lady looked at that every month at that bill, and I'm sure as many of the bills we look at, it just creates more confusion because you can't understand them. Confusion is something that we all face, no matter who you are. You know, when I first come to Christ, I, I was thinking about this this morning. Um, I made a track when I first got saved, uh, kind of about my life. And uh, the title of it, I kind of wrestled with, you know, what would I call my little track? And I finally ended up coming at a place where I titled it From Confusion to Confession. You know, and that's just what it is. You know, we live life so many times in confusion because even the smallest thing that weighs on our mind can bog us down. It'll bog us down to the place where we focus on that one thing and we can't do anything else. And I've seen this time after time and I fought it in my own life because that one thing will all we think about and it totally consumes our life. And the bigger the problem, the more it consumes. And to me, it's kind of a sad situation to come into that place because as followers of Christ, we walk this narrow path. We walk it every single day. And there will be moments that we face these stumbling blocks. And the greatest stumbling block we will face will be confusion. I don't know how many times I've heard somebody wrestle with the idea of what is God's will for my life. What is God's will? I wrestled with that myself for a long time. But I see it continually. I even see it in mature people. And this saddens me more than anything, where they wrestle with the idea of what I'm supposed to do with my life. They've been in ministry for years, and they still don't know what God's purpose for them is. That's sad to me. It's sad. Because we ought to have such a clear-cut idea of where we're going and what we're to do. And if we don't have that, we better get on our face until we find it. We must do that. Because if we allow a confusion to come in, all it's going to do is make us of no effect. We are no good to the kingdom and we're no good to this earth. Because we're so lost in the confusion of that one moment that we can't get past it. It's a stumbling block. And we find ourselves in this time very vulnerable. We'll be very vulnerable at that moment. Because of the fact confusion will blind our eyes to the reality that we are to walk in. We'll be blinded to the true reality that we are to walk in because we won't see who we truly are in Christ. I need to know who I am in Christ. And when I know who I am in Christ, then I can do what Christ wants me to do. But if I don't know who I am, I don't know the identity that I walk in, then I'm in trouble. And I will constantly be blinded by the, <clears throat> the, the littlest thing that comes into my life. Well, what happens in this situation, this becomes a stumbling block because all we will do is walk around in the darkness. And if you've ever fumbled around in the dark, you know what I'm talking about. 
we went to um, Tennessee, Pigeon Forge, that area, whatever that place is down there. Well, we went into this cave, and they had some tourist trap thing, so we went. And it was pretty cool. You walk down into these caves. Well, the guy asked us the question. He goes, do you want to know, see what true darkness is? And, you know, and everybody naturally says yes. And he shut the lights off. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. It was so dark in there. That's darkness. But yet that's how many times we walk each day in that darkness. Many times. Because we've blinded ourselves of our purpose. Because of the confusion that comes into our life. I don't care who you are or how long you've walked in Christ. The greatest tool the enemy will use against you is confusion. And I don't care who you are. I like what Henry, uh, Harry Truman said. He summed up the devil's playbook in, in one sentence. And that's what he said. If you, can convince, if you can't convince them, confuse them. And that's still what the government does today. But it's also a play right out of the devil's playbook. Because that's what he does to us. That's his desire. Because if he can put us into this place, you'll be fumbling around in the dark and you won't know how to get out. You will trip over anything. You'll be afraid to move because you don't know what's next. You don't know what you're going to run into or what you're going to trip over. You know, when I look at the life of Peter, I see this. I see him fight this same thing. I believe when they arrested Jesus, Peter's mind was in a turmoil. I believe they all was. They all ran. They all scattered. And we don't know much about the rest of them, but we do know about John and Peter. Peter's the one I focus on because he's the one that was warned not to reject Jesus and the one that did. But think of the confusion that Peter must have been in at that moment. Think of the confusion when they arrested Jesus. And Peter's wondering what in the world has just happened. This isn't supposed to be this way. This isn't supposed to happen. He is the Messiah. This isn't supposed to happen. The confusion that must have went through his mind is unbelievable. All this that he's seen in the last three years. He's seen the miracles. He's seen the blessings. And now they arrested him, and he didn't fight back. He submitted and went with them. It had to send Peter's mind into such an upheaval. And to me, it's sad to see this. But he had to wonder what was going to happen to Jesus. What was going to happen to us? Because it always comes back to us. What is going to happen to us? And this list for Peter goes on and on. All the things that boggle the mind. But to mankind's shame, we followed this course for years. Ever since the time of Adam and Eve, the devil's used this same thing. Confusing us, not, not knowing right from wrong, not knowing truth from falsehoods. And he keeps us trapped in that way. But yet that was never God's plan. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is what? Not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. Now watch what he goes on to say. God is the God of peace as in all churches of the saints. God don't create confusion. If there's confusion, it's coming from the enemy. It's not coming from God. So when we see ourselves in this position, we better be careful. And this is when we need to get on our face before God. We don't have all the answers. We're not that strong or that tough on our own. But when I can get on my face and realize what I have in Christ, this begins to change because our eyes begin to open. The narrow path, our minds always need to be fixed on clarity. We have to walk in clarity. I can't walk in blindness. And I've welded for years. But I used to get mad when I got a little older because my eyes weren't what they used to be. And I couldn't see like I used to. And I'd be welding something inside a, a, like a, a container or whatever. It wasn't a lot of room and you had to stand out here and reach in. Well, I was great to about right here. And then I was great out here. But it was from here to here. I couldn't see it. My eyes couldn't see it. They couldn't adjust. They couldn't focus. And it was so aggravating because you're trying to do your best, but you can't see. Everything's blurry. Everything's dark. But yet that's what happens when we don't walk in the clarity of knowing who I am in Christ. We walk in that blindness like somebody shut the light off in the cave. And we must have a clarity. But when we realize this, 
if I don't have that clarity, what happens is I begin to walk in doubt. I begin to walk in doubt of who I am and who Jesus is and what Jesus can do in my life. Just like what Delinda was saying earlier. How can she trust God to help her if she can't see the clarity of God's word to know that I can stand on that promise? It makes a great difference in our lives because at this point, our lives be with a skewed perspective of who I am and who Jesus is. I don't want to walk around with a skewed perspective. I want to know who he is and how it operates. Because at this point, we're going to walk into a life of defeat if we don't know who he is. Ever since I was a little kid, I hated to lose. I still don't like losing. Don't like to lose. I like to win. Everybody likes to win. But I want to win in life now, not some little game. I want to live in life. And when I can do that and win, it makes all the difference in the world, but I cannot win if I lead myself into a place of defeat. I have to stand strong on the principles God set down in his word. Solomon, all his wisdom was no different than us. I like Solomon. I like to use him because we learn a lot from him. I don't want to follow him because he didn't do well. He started out great, but he didn't finish well. I want to see the guy that finishes well, but I can learn from Solomon. I believe this is what brought Solomon down was confusion. Confusion brought him to a place where it took him off the path. Now watch this verse in Ecclesiastes 1.14. It's a very familiar verse. He said, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. When we look at this word, that word vanity means empty. It means an emptiness. There was an emptiness within Solomon. He had that blindness about him that all he could see was vanity, that place where nothing amounted to anything. And in all his wisdom, he could not break free from the emptiness that was in his life, thinking there had to be something more that he couldn't find. And I think that brought within Solomon a confusion that led to his downfall. Why did this happen? And I believe it was this. I believe because he began to look from a human perspective. He didn't look at it from a godly perspective or one led by the Spirit. He worked on it, on it through his own humanity, his own wisdom, and that does not work. We will fall every time. Confusion blinded him of seeing how God was at work in all these situations. I don't care how mundane your life seems, God is still at work. And we have to see that. Because if not, you're going to look at your life as vexed. It's something that, that, that there's nothing but vanity and vexation of spirit. There's an emptiness that brings no pleasure. I don't want to live that way. And I know you don't either. So we have to come away from that emptiness and realize that that's coming from the enemy that's causing a confusion in my life that don't give me the ability to go beyond that. There are many ways that can, confusion can disrupt our walk. Many. And this is why I think confusion is such a dangerous thing. But I want you to note some verses here. <clears throat> when we get into Isaiah, Isaiah speaks of this in a great way. Now this, you're going to have to hang on here. Isaiah 41, 24, it says, behold. He said, hey, pay attention. He's trying to tell us something. Now watch what he says. Ye are of nothing. He's speaking of false prophets. And your work of naught. Now watch this. And an abomination is he that chooseth you. That is a powerful statement when you break this thing down. And I'm going to break it down for just a moment. When you begin to look at the word of the abomination here, he's talking to us now. Now these false prophets were giving bad information. They was giving false prophecies. And he's saying, you are of nothing. What your words are are nothing. You are nothing when you state these words. And your work of naught is not going to come to any fruit. Now watch what he says to those that are listening to the false prophets. And an abomination is he that chooseth you. We refuse to listen to the word and refuse to listen to the false gospels. We are an abomination. Now what that means is that we are disgusting to look at. That's how much emphasis is on that word. Now, how this relates to our world today. We see so much of this going on today. So many people preaching a false gospel, a, a liberal, woke gospel. And when you see that, it's of naught. And you are of nothing because you've strayed from the, the gospel. 
And when we stray from the gospel, those that follow that and want to uphold that are an abomination in God's eyes. They're an abomination. What happens when they get, begin to follow this? Now watch this next verse, in the, the very last verse. Now some of this I put in here, so I'll tell you where I put in. It says, Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind, meaning an insubstantial, small, or weak, and confusion. That's what they bring, confusion. This word vanity in here is a different word than what they use in Solomon. If you look it up in Hebrew, it's a different Hebrew word. But with this one, it means wickedness. Behold, they all are wickedness. Powerful statements that Isaiah has given to us here. Even with all the warnings, we still see this run rampant today. It's no different than the days that Isaiah printed this. But it's sad to see. Let's move to Jeremiah. Know what Jeremiah says in this. <coughs> Jeremiah 3.25. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth, even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Now let's go back. I want to break this down a little bit. What we realize is that this lying down means this. It's a lying down to sleep. When you get into this and really search it out, this is a spiritual adultery is what it is. It, it's a shame. You're lying down with the harlot. That spiritual adultery is what it's talking about. And it's these false prophets, the very ones that Isaiah was speaking about. Now, he said, we lie down in our shame. This is something that's a, a, a disgust because of my life. It goes back to that abomination that it were disgusting to even look on. And this is how God sees it. But know what Jeremiah says. Our confusion covereth us. Now, this to me is an interesting word because when we get to this covering, it's an overwhelming. All this stuff that's taken place in my life when I'm separated for God and I'm walking in the world, all these things are flooding into me to where my shame covers me. That confusion now has become my blanket and we live in that state and that's why I named that track from confusion to confession. Because when you get rid of confusion, your eyes begin to open and you see your life for what it truly is. Big difference from what we are supposed to be walking from what we see right there. We need to be walking, not covered in, in shame by our confusion, but we need to be covered by the blood of Christ where we can stand knowing who I am through the precious blood that he surrendered for me. All this is what we stand by. We are covered, clothed, overwhelmed by that confusion because it's the greatest cause of confusion we see right here. For we have sinned. And I don't care where you're at in your life. If you're walking in sin, you're going to have confusion. There's no way around it because you will see that confusion wrapped up in guilt. It'll come in the form of guilt. And you know when that guilt hits, you're in that spot of confusion where you're one moment away from the devil whipping you. And he's going to push you off that path to where you do not walk for Christ. They simply took their eyes off of God. Now let's move it to the New Testament. Look at James 3.16. I put some stuff in here too. For where envy or jealousy and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. Now watch this, because now James took it from the, the outward, as he did in Jeremiah and Isaiah, to the inward here, because now he's dealing with emotion. Where envy or jealousy is, there is strife and is confusion. Strife is always going to bring confusion. And when we look at this, it's the very end of what takes place. When we allow our emotions to fester, to come to this place, it gives confusion a foothold. And when it gets a foothold, it's just a matter of time where you get knocked off that path. Guard your path. Guard your path. What this shows us is that we can control the level of that confusion in our life. That's what it tells me. Now watch here. What do I seek in life? If I want to rid myself of confusion, there's two things. Do I desire to seek righteousness, allowing the Spirit to lead me to where my eyes are always open to truth? Is that the way I'm walking? Is the Spirit leading your life, or are you allowing the enemy or the flesh to 
Do I have reject? Uh, do I live rejecting sin, knowing that it is separation from the Father, or do I live in my sin to where sin defeats to a place of living in that confusion? We make these choices. It's a matter of how I want to live my life. And you say, well, that may be hard, but that's okay. We need that. We need to have an idea that we cannot live in sin and be all right with God. We have to walk in righteousness. We have to walk in holiness. I believe the greatest way that we can overcome confusion is by seeking the Lord and his truth. And we do that through his word. We do that through learning the word. We have to realize that confusion comes in darkness. Remember what I said about that cave? You couldn't see where you was going. You had no way of knowing how to get out of there until he flipped that light back on. Because light dispels darkness. That's the beauty of Christ. When we read of him in John, he came into the world and he shined the light and he lit the world and dispelled the darkness of sin. And to me, that's a fascinating thing because when the light of Christ is lit, what takes place is that that light brings peace and it dispels that confusion. And when that confusion is diffused, it brings a contentment because then we find a peace in life and a joy in our life. Nothing is more happy than the day we come to Christ. Now, I remember the day I accepted Jesus. It took me a couple days to realize what happened. But when I finally realized what took place in my life, uh, whew, man, there was a peace that come over me and a happiness and a joy that I hadn't had in a long, long, long time. And to me, that was the greatest thing in life. But I see this take place and how this works is, is we see it in Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus to me was an interesting guy. Nicodemus wanted to know the truth. Nicodemus had heard of all the miracles, and I'm sure he's seen some that Jesus had performed. But by this, there was confusion in Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He followed the ways of the Pharisee. So on one hand, you got Jesus who's doing all these miracles that does everything that lines up with what was commanded of by the Messiah. But these Pharisees over here are saying, he's of the devil. And poor old Nicodemus says, how can this be? Now there's confusion. There's confusion. What do I believe? They say this is true. These guys say this is true. These guys lift him up. These guys condemn him. But I love what Nicodemus did. Nicodemus went right to Jesus. He went to Jesus. He went to the source. And he went to the source to find out. And that meeting that Nicodemus had, it changed his life forever. It changed his life forever, overcoming his confusion, which tells me that when the light of Christ comes on in your life, you do not have to walk in confusion. It is gone. How do we as Nicodemus come over this in our life? I believe the first thing is we need to walk seeking understanding. We need to seek that understanding in a great way. Nicodemus came to the place where he found the reality of Christ ahead of his vain thoughts, his empty thoughts of what Christ should be and what he shouldn't be. He went to Christ and see what he truly was. But he also pushed away the ideas of the religious thought because that's all the Pharisees were. They were religious people. It was all outwardly, nothing inwardly. And I think this is what Nicodemus seen. He wanted to know the truth and he wanted to walk in the reality of that truth. And that was only in Christ. Note the parable that Jesus gave. We've seen this before, but it really comes to, to life here. In Matthew 7, 26, it said, And everyone that heareth thee says of my, sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Familiar verse. But I want to focus on one word, that word heareth. That word heareth is an important word, because it carries a lot of weight in this situation. It basically means this. It means to hearken to or understand what I'm saying. We have to have an understanding of what Christ is telling us in his word. You know, it's not enough to come to a church service and just sit here and listen. I, I get frustrated with that. I got frustrated when I was out there, and I get frustrated with it up here. I used to sit in church services and walk out just as empty as I came in because there was no meat of the word. All they did was give you a bunch of fluff. I even told Marcia that one time when I came home, I am so sick of milk I could throw up. 
I didn't say it in them words, but I'll be nice. I get tired of that. God wants to give us the meat of the word, not something to just sit there and give us milk like a baby. We want the meat of the word. We want the truth and the power of it. Hearers are only going to want the milk. They're only going to want the milk because they don't have to work hard for the milk. You have to work hard for the steak because it's a little more expensive, but it's worth a whole lot more. And there's so much more value in it. And we must come to that place. It's easy to sit and listen. It's easy to just come to that place. But we have to understand the word because we have to know what to obey. If I don't know what to obey, how do I know how to stay on the path? I have to know what to obey. And I only find that in God's word. And if I only am going to be the hearer, I only have one outcome, and that's I play the fool. I play the fool. Now, those may be hard words, and that's okay because they're not mine. They're right there. They're all right there if we just see them. We are given everything that we need to understand the Word of God. Everything. But look what happens to the hearer. In thir uh, Matthew 13, 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside, and it was just gone, taken away. And the enemy stole it. And it comes from being confused. I've heard so many people say, this is so confusing, I don't understand it. You know, babies, when they take in food, they drink that milk for six months, three months, whatever it is. But then you slowly chop up her all food into little bitty mush and slowly start giving them solid food. Pretty soon they're six years old and they see me eating a steak, say, Dad, where's mine? I want one of those. You're getting hamburger, boy. You can't afford a steak yet. But that's the way we grow. And that's the way we seek it. There is no hope if there's no understanding. There is no hope. We will be like the fool. And it will just be pulled away from us. And to me, that's a sad state of confusion. That's all it is. And we must walk away. Because all we will do is be blown away in the storm. I want to know God's message here in Hosea. I love this verse. Hosea 4, 6. Now note this. He's not talking to the world. He says, my people, these are his people, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. That's an awesome verse. But man, how it comes on to us. Now, if you look at this and you begin to see this word knowledge, in our day, we think of knowledge as book smart. We're, we'll have all this knowledge in our head. But that's not what it means. What it means is this. It means that I lack a knowledge of God. They lack a knowledge of God. And if I lack a knowledge of God, he said, I will reject thee. It is our responsibility to know this word. Our responsibility. Now, understand this. And, and, and I guess if you want to get mad at me, I'm okay with that too. I have you for about an hour a week, sometimes two. There's a whole lot of rest of the week that I can't teach you. I can't do anything with it. It's up to us to take this word. Read it. And don't read it. Study it. He said to study, to show thyself approved. Because when we refuse to learn God's word in his way, it means that we are undone. Because that word destroyed, that's just what it means. It means to d be dumb or silent, to perish, to destroy, to be undone. Our life becomes undone, confused, when we don't get into this word. Well, we don't understand what it says. The second thing is we defeat confusion by our faith. Now, I'm going to try to hurry through this. Oh, I got time, I guess. We're still early. No David here, 71 Psalms 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. This is an interesting verse to me coming from David. 
And, and it's a powerful verse because it came from David. Now that word trust is the same word as faith. It's putting a, a confidence or a hope in something. That is faith. Our faith is a living hope. So when we look at this, this is what David's referring to. He's referring to faith. David placed his faith, his trust in the Lord. And he tells that repeatedly through the Psalms. He asked for God's assistance. Now, what did he ask for assistance for? Let me never be put to confusion. That's what David was asking for. He never wanted to come to that place because he knew that if he lost his faith, if he lost that trust in God, it would lead him into a place of confusion. Now, what is interesting about that is when we get into the New Testament, we take this verse and we allow Paul to expound on it. In Romans 5, 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore, being justified by faith, basically what David was saying, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This to me is an awesome, awesome verse because what it tells us that peace comes by a lack of confusion. If I work my life every single day to live without that confusion, then I'm working my life out to where there's peace. There's peace in my life. And this is what David was praying for. <coughs> David was praying for peace. That's what he was after. Now, think about David's life. David couldn't even build the temple because he was a man of war. He was a bloody man of war. David was a vicious man. And you read his escapades in the, in the Kings and in, in Samuel, you'll see how David was. He was not afraid of a fight. But when we look at this and see it, he still desired peace in his life. I think internally, David wrestled with that every single day. But peace came from a lack of confusion. And we only have that through faith in Christ. Now understand this. David, in his life, always knew that faith was just a breath away of losing it. He can lose it instantly. But note what Paul tells us. Paul tells us if we are in Christ, that peace is always with us. That peace is always there. Now, grab that. Because every one of you that walk in confusion do not have to. We can walk in peace by our faith in Christ. And if we would grab that, what a difference it would make. But if we allow confusion to get a foothold, we will live in defeat. And there will be no way around it. We will fall into the enemy's plan and we will give up, and we will make Truman's words become a reality. And I don't want to live that way. We must come to a place where we have a greater knowledge, because when we do, we allow this verse, and I close with this. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations. It's reasoning thoughts. This is what we're to cast down. Now watch this. And every high thing, that's a barrier. Now get this. I am to cast down all those things that are going to separate me from Christ. All those things that's going to stop my faith. We talk so much about stumbling blocks. Well, they're right there. Imaginations, reasoning, and thoughts, they will be what creates a barrier in my life, a stumbling block that I will trip up on my path. And what happens if I trip up on my path? I fall down. Jesus keeps walking and I lose my way. Now watch what he says. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, going right back to what Hosea was saying, and bringeth into captivity every thought. I am to bring into every thought a perception and a purpose to the obedience of Christ. Powerful, powerful statement there Paul gives us. <coughs> but because of this, it tells me that I have the ability to live beyond my confusion. And I can walk into that place of peace when I do this. If I take this verse and apply it with these thoughts, casting down that bad reasoning, casting down them bad thoughts, and every barrier. This is what I've been preaching on for the last month, and I don't know how much longer. Those barriers that's going to keep me from that. Those barriers will keep me 
from following Christ and it'll block the knowledge for him. We all live for the moment, but we must not. We must live for the future where we control every emotion and in our walk. Because when we can do that, then we will walk with the peace that we need. Father, we thank you for the love of the Lord Jesus. Father, there is nothing.